was an interview with Jane Paul Davis on September 14, 1976. This interview is being taped by Angela Broadhead and Bronwyn Hewer. Fern, the Lafayette Historical Society has honored you this year by dedicating its book, Lafayette, A Pictorial History, to you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, you were going to ask me uh, something about uh, my coming to Lafayette? Well, I thought you might uh, make a comment about the book first. Oh, you are, oh, well, of course, uh, the dedication of the book was one of the highlights of my life. I can think of uh, maybe one or two other events in my life that uh, I, in which I felt so honored. And, um, and the autographing party that we had uh, last Sunday afternoon at the library was uh, very enjoyable, seeing lots of old friends and people who came for the books and for autographs. Well, this seems such an appropriate time to have you tell us a little bit about this area, Fern. When did you first come to Lafayette? Well, I first came to, first saw Lafayette in about 1920. And little did I realize then that Lafayette would mean anything to me the rest of my life or that I would ever live there or that my family would ever live there. But when I was at Mills College in, uh, it was around 1919 and 20s, uh, I used to come out to Happy Valley to visit my favorite uncle, my uncle Art. Arthur Powell, who uh, was living in Happy Valley with his family, and he'd gone into the real estate business in Lafayette. So I used to come out to see him and, and my cousins, and uh, he lived in a little uh, unpretentious home out in Happy Valley. All the homes were little and unpretentious then, in uh, 1919, uh, because Happy Valley was just a beautiful, wide open expanse of rolling hills, no large trees, uh, no uh, beautiful uh, estates, uh, just um, orchards, um, some vineyards, uh, vegetable gardens, and um, um, little farms. Uh, so that uh, it was, it's, it looked so different from what it does now, because you know when a town or a city grows up, all of the big shrubs and huge big trees and all grow from being planted. Well, there was none of that then, of course. It was just a country uh, farming. Yes. A little valley that was all farms. So, <coughs> unfortunately, my Uncle Arthur died suddenly uh, in uh, about 1932. Uh, my father came down from um, Sebastopol, where my father and mother, David, David Powell and Cora Powell had had a Gravenstein apple orchard for, oh, 30 years. My father came down to settle the estate because Uncle Art had, got, uh, had been quite heavily involved in uh, real estate business. He got down to Lafayette and he fell in love with it and he said, we're going to lease the ranch and we're coming down here and I'm going to go on with the, with the real estate business. My mother was horrified. She was a great uh, club woman and uh, uh, loved, uh, was always very interested in civic affairs and such things. She didn't want to leave Sebastopol. However, they came. And um, they rented for a while, and then in about 1935, they bought a beautiful lot up on Boyer Circle, and they built an adobe home. Uh, at that time, there were some Mexicans around here who used to make the adobe bricks and, uh, and build these adobe homes. There were just a few being built. And I remember coming down to visit <coughs> and seeing the adobe bricks uh, uh, all over the hillside where the house later stood because they, they made the adobe uh, right out of the adobe soil, mixed it with whatever they mix it with. And um, so that then became the family home and my folks lived in that home. Uh, both of them died in that home. Um, they lived there from 1935 to uh, the time of my mother's death, which was 1959. Uh, then I lived in the home. And I also lived in the home oh, numerous other times, many, many summers, all summer long, I would come and stay. So I was in Lafayette, you might say, off and on. Uh, I knew a great deal about it through my family from the 1930s. 
But of course, I'm not really uh, an old timer. I'm not a pioneer, and I'm not making these comments, uh, uh, presuming to be either one of those two things. I'm just remembering some of the things as I remember in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Are you going to tell us about some of the people that you knew yes. during that time? Yes. Oh. Fortunately, I did know. I knew two of the real pioneers. I knew Carrie Huff Van Meter, and I knew Jenny Bickerstaff Rosenberg in their late years. And a, a little bit later on, I'll, I'll tell you about them, what I remember about them. But um, one thing I want to say, in the, um, when we came out uh, to visit my Uncle Arthur, of course, we used to come through the old, old, old tunnel up at the top of the hill. And that was the one that was just a single, almost as well as a two-bore, but it was, it was built for Model T Fords. So it was terribly narrow and very, very dark. There were no lights in it. But the thing that I remember the most about it and the thing that frightened me the most was it was so wet. It was running with water. From the ceiling? Yes. The water ran down the beams. Of course, it was all wooden beams, just great big square wooden beams, and you wondered as you went through if they were really going to hold up while you were in there. Uh, and uh, there was this water seepage all the time, so that it was kind of slimy and scummy, and that ran down these beams all the time, and the floor part was wet almost all the time. That's one of the things I remember about the tunnel, that and the fact it was so narrow and it was so dark. Um, but we lived in Ukiah at that time, and my two little girls, Jan and Joyce, were um, five and nine, about those years. We used to come down often, and sometimes my girls would come down and stay a month with my folks in Lafayette, and uh, uh, they, they were their only grandchildren, mm -hmm. because I was an only child, so of course they were adored. and. Um, so we came, uh, we came quite often. We came, and we used to came and stayed a month at one time and uh, when the Treasure Island Fair was going on. And then we went every few days um, over t to see the fair, which was a marvelous experience. But when we came down from Ukiah, where we lived, we always came down the Napa Valley because it was such a beautiful drive. We loved it, and it was a bit shorter. Uh, so we would take the, uh, come to Benicia and take the ferry and come across. So then we would enter into Lafayette, and this is in 1932 and 3, uh, by way of Walnut Creek. And um, as I remembered it, I try to think back how I remember how it looked then. And some of the pictures that we have in our files refresh my memory because I remembered then I say, oh, that's the way it looked when I first came here. Most of the business was on the left-hand side of the street, that would be the south, as coming from Walnut Creek. Uh, on the other side of the street, where Peter Thompson's building was, it was still standing there, of course, when I started coming, uh, was just trees and some weeds and a path, and um, uh, there, were, there was no sidewalk and not very many buildings. Um, I never saw the night, the little church, the little, oh, what we call the old Knights Templar Hall. That had been removed. The hill was still there. Uh, but the little Knights Templar building had been removed uh, before I started coming in 30, in the early 30s. But, um, but Clarence uh, Brown had not leveled down the hill yet. Of course, I can remember that we went shopping at the Pioneer Store. And of course, the uh, McNeils had just sold it, um, and it was Mr. Hinckley's then. Yeah. And I can remember going up the boardwalk. It, it had a boardwalk uh, there in front of it, and going in, and it was a, an old, worn board floor inside. I can remember that. And it was just an old-fashioned, old country store. Then the other store in town that I remember was Mickey Meyer's store. Uh, my mother and I used to go grocery shopping there. Uh, that's in the in the building now, which is really the the Starks building because Louis Starks built that building in 1914. Now that was on uh, Mont Diablo Boulevard and corner, the uh, Mont Diablo Huff. Boulevard and Huff. Oh yes, it's the one that has been newly remodeled for Griffin's menswear. That new building, the one they took the old soda fountain out of. 
So Mickey Myers had his grocery store there. And then, you know, most people have forgotten, and I had forgotten until I saw a picture of it the other day, uh, the Emporium. I wonder how many people remember the Emporium. It, I went there. You remember the Emporium. Mm -hmm. It was just a little old-fashioned um, general merchandise store of, of ready-made, um, ready-to-wear ready, ma ready to wear goods. You still, could buy shoes. Still there in 1955. Is that when they moved? They moved they moved over to where Los Gallus is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and enlarged and it became quite a large place. But this was just a little old fashioned place. And you could buy shoes and hats and uh and a lingerie and dresses and what else could you buy in there? Oh, oh. in fact it was the only place in town where you could buy those things. Back in the thirties. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was the it was the only place like that in town. And then uh, Lou's, um, Lou's saloon, Lou Borgazzani's saloon was there too in the 30s when I came. I don't remember so much about it because I never patronized the saloons, <laughs> but it was a very popular place. And Lou Borgazzani, I guess, uh, was a man I've heard so much about him who was loved by everybody. He, uh, he was a very popular man, very fine man. And he's still living and has retired and lives up at Lake County now. And where was the saloon? That was across the street on Mount Diablo Boulevard? Uh, no, it was on the same side of the street as the Emporium and, um, and, um, and, cl and, um, and the store, the grocery store, Mickey Myers grocery store. It was in one of those little buildings in, right in between there. And then, of course, uh, Lou's saloon, uh, I think maybe this was even before, yes, uh, this was even before his saloon used to be right on Mont Diablo Boulevard when the little red um, treasure, not treasure, uh, what's that little red building under the big oak tree on Huff, where the second little second-hand store? Oh, it's called the Nifty Thrifty. The Nifty Thrifty, yes. That building used to face Mont Diablo Boulevard and at one time um, that was Lou's lose store. And of course the story goes, and I've heard people say, and it's true, Ken, Ken Brown says it's true, that during the, um, during the horse, horse uh, shows, uh, that the fellow that won the trophy, the highest trophy, the whatever he won it for, rode his horse into that saloon uh, for a uh, celebration drink. <laughs> and he just rode his horse right through the double doors. <laughs> So those were the those were the good old days in Lafayette. <laughs> those were back in the '30s because the horse shows, of course, were in the th were were in the '30s. Now, um, of course, uh, uh, Jenny, um, Mrs. Dewing, at that time, Jenny Bickerstaff Dewing, uh, she was living, of course, in that time in her home or little cottage on Mont Diablo, um, where she lived for 85 years but a little more about that later. Up on Boyer Circle, where uh, the folks built the adobe at that time, there was one large Spanish-type home, and it belonged, Mr. Spurgeon lived in it. He was a very prominent citizen and um, uh, in town, and I don't know his background or his history, but he had a great deal to do with um, getting the Calica Tunnel through, uh, getting the uh, Sa Sacramento Northern Railroad through, getting the McCollumy water uh, pipes and all that when it came through. Uh, he was a, a very important citizen, Mr. Spurgeon. I remember him well. He was a, a testy, uh, kind of a cross. I mean, he always seemed to me cross, but he was very highly respected. And uh, And then up on Boyer Circle, there were a number of very attractive summer homes, little cottages, with a veranda all the way around screened in, and an outdoor barbecue. There was one near our house when they built it, uh, belonging to San Francisco people and Oakland people who, who came out there for the summer. And Boyer Circle was a nice location because it had a beautiful view of Mont Diablo. And so I'd say that there were, oh, half a dozen of those little cottages uh, up there on the hill when my folks built in 35.
in the 1940s, I think that's all I can need to say unless you want to ask me something about more about the 30s. Well, of if you course, have any other citizens that you would of the think 30s. of that would, would add to our... In the 30s. 30s. Oh, well, of course there, there were... Um, there were my father's friends. Yes. Uh, I did want to mention uh, my father's friends, the realtors, uh, who were so well known. Mr. Sweet, I can't remember his first name, but of course these men all have streets named after them, and uh, usually I suppose in their subdivisions, uh, Mr. Sweet, and there was George Foy, who was a good friend of my father's, and, uh, and, uh, and surprisingly enough, George Foy and my father died in the same week. And C. C. Morse, who was the owner of the Lafayette Sun at that time, uh, wrote um, an editor obitu obituary editorial about the two men, and it was uh, a long one in large print in the Lafayette Sun, outlined in black. Uh, you know that goes back way back in when the paper newspapers used to. Well, he an was honor. an old-fashioned editor, and he did. And he did. He wrote a very. I have a. I have, a co I have a copy of it in the family Bible. <laughs> so my, George Foy was a good friend of my father's. And then, of course, there was Colonel Garrett. And Colonel Garrett lived many years after that. And he built the, um, his beautiful brick uh, building, which we now know, of course, as the Garrett Building. Um, he was a, he was a hail fellow, well met. And whether he was ever really a colonel, people never knew. But he was an army man. And he had retired from the army in 1920, and he came into Lafayette, and he fell in love with it, went into the real estate business, and he bought 100 acres or so out in Happy Valley, and um, and later on built his home, his beautiful home in Happy Valley, and um, and uh, lived there for 40 years in that home. Uh, but he had his office uh, in that in the very front part of the brick building, as we know it now, where that great big front plate glass window is. And his desk was facing the window. He always sat at his desk. I can remember seeing him there so much. Um, he always sat at his desk looking out so he could see everybody that went by and every car that went by. And he'd hail people and tell them to come on in. And uh, he had a beautiful collie dog uh, that was his constant companion. And the collie dog was always right by his side. And uh, so those are some of the people that I'm, of course, I knew Mickey Myers. And, um, and I knew Mrs. Snedeker at that time. She and her husband were in the real estate business, not quite back to the 30s, I believe. Um, Dr. Filer. Dr. Filer was my father's doctor. And um, he later on built his home up on Boyer Circle, so that we were neighbors up there. But I remember Dr. Filer as one of his first offices. Uh, do you know that little old, really old-looking building that's right at the corner of First Street and Golden Gate Way? It's yes. on the theater side. It's oh, a little oh, yes. kind of a shacky-looking yeah. place. Mm -hmm. That was Dr. Filer's office when I first knew him. Oh. In that, uh, in that yeah, little sort of old the building. Of town, then. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And um, and then, of course, later in the in the forties, I um, I knew my old friend, got to know my old friend Ted Murphy, that I had known many many years ago in Susanville, uh, in the nineteen early twenties before he came here. Now that that's the something about the people that I knew. In the 1940s, let's see. In the 1940s, we um, we became rather Lafayette became rather a celebrity of sorts, if you could call it that, because we had what was called the Strip, and of course things were wild and wide open in the war years. Those were the war years. People were doing all kinds of things. Gambling was getting to be rampant around and. And um, uh, people were tearing around the country, going to nightclubs, and uh, why people do things like that in war years, don't ask me. But at any rate, our main street, Mont Diablo, was called the Strip. And it became famous, and I guess it was known all over the world, probably, uh, because there were so many servicemen that came out, too, and officers. Uh, beginning with the, the, uh, the Strip began with the Red Mill. And that was the uh, the nightclub, which later on became a uh, motel, out 
beyond Cape Cod, out near um, Upper Happy Valley. You remember the mill? The, yes, the red near mill? the school. Yes, no, yes. And that that was uh, that was a nightclub, and a, and a restaurant, an eating place. In the forties, this was. And then the next place was the Cape Cod. It was there. Then um, in on into town, the next place was a great big brick monstrosity, it was, which they built where the Lafayette Federal Savings and Loan is now. In fact, the Federal Savings and Loan has been remodeled from this old brick building. Do you remember it? Yes, I yes. remember that. They used to call the... It had three or four names. Yes. It changed hands so many times after the war years uh, because it never could make a, a go. It was too... I don't know. It, was, it had a jinx. It was too big or something. And it was called... Um, Ted Murphy knows the names of all of them. Uh, but the name that I remember was Acapulco, and that was when it had the rather lurid drapes at the windows. I mean, it looked like a red light district, really, is what it, it just, when you went by it, you know, you wondered what was going on in there. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. Then the next thing, a building, was the Tunnel Inn. And the Tunnel Inn then had the great big water tank on the corner. Of course, it still has the water tank, but it's all camouflaged. And I hated to see it get camouflaged. Uh, because in those days, when it was the Tunnel Inn, and when Jay Bedford owned it, um, and a man by the name of Schultz owned it before Bedford did, they used the, the water tank was used because it held water, and it had a great big uh, fire hose that came out of it with a big nozzle on it. Do you remember seeing that? No, well, it came that. down, it was draped around the front out there. Um, and uh, I guess it was there in case of fire. I don't know how, whether, how the water was used. But at anyhow, it was then known as the Tunnel Inn. And Jay Bedford was a, 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 certainly a fanciful character. He was a sleight of hand performer. <coughs> Did either one of you know him? No, I don't. I remember hearing about it. People flocked to, to there from all over the Bay Area to see him, and I did too. I used to go in there and just sit and watch him just pull rabbits out of the out of the uh, bourbon bottles, <laughs> practically, and and throw cards up to the ceiling that would uh, that would uh, stick, you know, and he'd know what the, uh, all this. Oh, he he was re he was not a professional, but he was a very fine amateur. Uh, so that the Tunnel Inn was noted for one of the, that was one of the things, and then the last one on the strip was the El Molino, and uh, that was down there, uh, uh, right on the corner of um, Oak um, Oak Grove. No, Hill. Oak, Oak Hill. Hill. Yeah. Oak Hill. Yes, El Molino, which later on, uh, let's see, later on that became another. Uh, that wasn't Danny Van Allen. Danny Van Allen's, oh. yes. That became Danny Van Allen's. But during the years, during the war years, uh, we had the strip. Uh, then we did understand, and if we went back and read the Lafayette Sun uh, old issues, it, I'm sure it would be fascinating to read about the underworld and the mafia who did try to get a, a holding in uh, Lafayette with gambling interests. And uh, we had an editor and an owner of the Lafayette Sun then whose name was... Um, was um, Silverman. His first name, I know it, but I can't say it. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Silverman fought this. He was the one that detected it. And his life was threatened so that even the county, um, uh, the county uh, law officers in the sheriff's department um, set up a protection, some kind of a protection for him and his family at that time. And we used to read in the papers and we used to hear about midnight rendezvous that he was having with with the heads of whoever the, this <laughs> gambling thing was out in the country. And it was really quite exciting. Somebody someday ought to get a hold of the old issues of the paper and read about that. It caused quite a flurry. And um, so though that that's about everything from the from the forties that I can remember. Now in the forties you were living on Boyer Circle. In the forties I was living on Boyer Circle in a part uh, 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 yes in the late forties because my daughter Jan then went to Akalani's High School. I'd been teaching for a number of years in the Martinez High School, Alhambra, and um, 
uh, my older daughter went to school there. I didn't want my younger daughter to go to school where I was teaching because it uh, it isn't too satisfactory. So I moved over into into mother's house, and um, and Jan went five years. She went five years, and I lived there five years. And uh, so of course I was part of Lafayette then. I was commuting to Martinez to school. Uh, <coughs> Those, those were the years, those were exciting years too. Those were the years that I worked with a group of Lafayette women out at St. Mary's College when the um, cadets from the Air Force, the United States Air Force cadets, were in training, uh, getting a college training there, and they took over St. Mary's. It, literally, they absolutely took it over. And there were many lay professors who came in, and the, the brothers were teaching too. And uh, so there were a number of us women who uh, who worked in the um, kitchen, and not the kitchen, but the dining area. We did the serving, and we served at the steam tables. Uh, served the boys, and we I did that every summer for about four summers. Uh, then the other interesting thing to me that was so fascinating were the straw hatters who were in the town hall uh, during the 40s, and uh, they were the theatrical group that came out to the University of California. And by Berry Hill was their leader uh, and organized them, and they just created a sensation and throughout the whole state. Uh, they became nationally known. Uh, people who visited the West here came to see them, and they came for four summers uh, and gave their shows in the in the Old Town Hall. Uh, their, all of their music and all of their skits were original. They wrote them all. They had very talented people, and. Um, Gordon uh, at Connell and his wife Janie uh, are on uh, our professional uh, theatrical people now in New York, and in fact they're in San Francisco now. I read I read in the paper the other day where she is in um, she's playing in something um, with the Curran or something, and they were with the original Star Hatters. And I went. I made coffee and served served uh, during the intermission, and I helped. Ran, ran all kinds of errands. Well, I, I was just a, a, a jack of all trades with them, but I loved it. And one reason that I did it is because I had charge of all of the the uh, dramatics at uh, at the high school, and in Martinez, uh, in Martinez and put on uh, two, two, a couple of plays every year, plus many many programs. And uh, I got all kinds of valuable uh, clues and hints and information, of course, and ideas. Uh, from the Straw Hatters, so it worked both ways. But I went. I went. Some of them got married. We went to their weddings, and we, when the children were born, we saw the new babies, and and uh, we, we were just part of the family. I just love those years of the Straw Hat. Describe the uh, was it? Describe the, the uh, town hall at that time. Well, the town hall at that time was very much on the inside, the way it is now. Uh, maybe I should repeat that. I have my mouth covered up. The town hall looked then, and during the Straw Hatters, the way it did now, except the downstairs was not as, um, well, it was more uh, rustic. It wasn't, uh, you know, you know, the, the dramaturgs have improved it a great deal. Uh, the seats were good, uh, but they weren't as good as the ones they have there now. But it was in tiers. Uh, in fact, the uh, Straw Hatters did that. The stage was just about the same. Um, they had, oh, what they worked with. They had, in order to get to their dressing room, which was downstairs, they had an outside stairway that they had to run up and down uh, to get down to change their costumes. And you know, their programs were all uh, blackouts, so that it was just zip, 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 zip. I mean, just it just went like lightning. So those kids would tear up and down those back stairs <laughs> as they changed to go from one skit to another. And uh, <clears throat> the kitchen was most primitive where I made the coffee. Oh, dear me. Uh, a couple of old uh, gas burners back there. And no, really, it's not a stove. And, uh, and an old sink, the plumbing didn't work. And um, very well, it worked, but not very well. And uh, of course, there was no air conditioning then. But, um, and the outside of it, of course, didn't wasn't shingled as it is now. It looked quite different. 
but um, but it was packed absolutely people were turned away every night every night they played because they were so they they had did political satire they were past masters at political satire and um, they just had people just rolling in the aisles with with their original skits that they wrote and uh, those are those are the things that I remember now in the 40s now when I first started um, talking today I said I was going to refer later to the two old pioneers that I really was fortunate enough to know back in the 1930s and 40s and uh, first um, I'd like to say uh, a little bit about Carrie Van Meter Carrie Van Meter as uh, as almost uh, everyone who reads our historical files knows uh, was uh, a postmaster or I always like to call her postmistress however they say you're not supposed to do that that you're supposed to call a lady a postmaster all right she was the postmaster in Lafayette from 1904 until 1927 and uh, <coughs> Carrie Van Meter was a Huff her father was Orlo Huff and he built a uh, little cottage the little house that we knew so many of us knew that was right there on Mont Diablo Boulevard where the Safeway store is now and um, uh, did did you uh, did either one of you remember ever having seen that house no it was gone yeah. by oh, the time I, it came I didn't realize that the the uh, the uh, Safeway uh, they tore it down when they built the Safeway and um, it was simply surrounded with shrubs and trees and and it was uh, unpainted I mean it was it was in a state of ruin it was not in a good condition at any rate her father uh, built that uh, home in the 1860s and after her father and mother died uh, Carrie Van Meter lived in it uh, Carrie Van Meter uh, was a very unusual woman uh, things I've heard about her read about her and um, have imagined about her <laughs> uh, are interesting uh, to me she had a, a sad life I, I think she had a sad life um, she married uh, her marriage uh, nobody ever said very much about her marriage uh, mr. van meter he was an outsider evidently he wasn't known enough yet uh, she wasn't married very long uh, and she divorced him came back and lived lived in the family home and she had her little girl her only child Pearl and of course Pearl was the light of her life and we have a number of pictures of Pearl as a little girl <coughs> in front of the post office with some pictures of her in front of the post office with her mother and then later on too so Carrie had no formal learning beyond I would judge the eighth grade uh, she was very different in that way from um, uh, Jenny Bickerstraff who of course had in those days what we consider a college education she'd been to to uh, teachers uh, normal school and got her teaching credential uh, Jenny did Carrie uh, didn't have any schooling but Carrie was a very very bright woman I would say that she was a brilliant woman in some ways um, so she lived alone with uh, with her daughter Pearl and um, when I say that her life was sad uh, she lost her daughter when her daughter was young in her early 20s in fact in 1922 and one of the things that that has interested me as so many things do in these historical files when you get going through them um, in the old uh, cemetery records which we have in our historical files the old 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 records going way back to the early 1900s and late 1800s um, in the 1922 it records the death of Pearl um, having died suddenly in the tunnel that's the way it's written in the cemetery records I, I read it I, we've got copies of those records and when I read that 
I was so surprised. So I began asking people, uh, some of the old timers like Alice and some of the others who might have known what was wrong with uh, Pearl. Well, it seems that she had some kind of a bone, we might call it rheumatism now or you know arthritis or something like that, they don't know. She was going to a chiropractor and um, they always thought that this sudden death had something to do with, with her treatments that she had had at the chiropractors. Now that, of course, is probably all hearsay. It may not be true at all, but the years have gone by and, and uh, it doesn't matter now if we say that um, that sudden death may have been caused from that. So <clears throat> that was a sad uh, thing that happened to Carrie, that and her, her marriage. But she um, was a very fine postmaster. You should see her handwriting. We have the early 1902, 1903, and 4, uh, and some of the other record, uh, post office record books in our files. And uh, of course, the whole book, some of those books are filled with her handwriting, recording everything. Beautiful handwriting. Well, after 1927, she became the librarian in uh, Lafayette. She had been the librarian up to that time, too, uh, because way back in 1904, she was, uh, she had books in the post office <laughs> and uh, uh, some, uh, I've, I've forgotten the date, but it was a very early date when the county, was it 1915 or 14 and when the county library was started? Uh, do you remember that? I'm sorry, I, I should Well, know it, it was around about that time. Uh, that then, we, we, then we did have the branch uh, at Lafayette and she was in charge of the branch. But before that time, back clear to 1904, she had books in the library. Um, I don't quite know where she got the books, but she'd always, you see, been interested in books and reading. So then in 1927, she became the official county branch librarian. I can remember in 19, in the 30s, when I used to, to go down with my mother, and in the 40s too, uh, as long as, as Carrie was in the library there, uh, get arm my mother was a reader she to get an armful of books and read them in a week and go back for another armful she and Carrie got to be very good friends they weren't one bit alike uh, Carrie was very um, rigid looking and uh, had a long uh, kind of a severe face uh, it wasn't the slightest bit interested in small talk or chit chat she wasn't that kind of a person at all um, but she and my mother became very good friends and uh, she uh, she got to, they she got to know mother's reading habits so that she saved mother uh, you know all the books that came in that she knew mother'd be interested in and she set aside for mother so they became very good friends and uh, so I used to go many many times in there and meet her and talk to her um, in later years she became, became um, it's sort of sad, but she did become sort of a recluse. And, um, and after she was uh, unable to uh, work in the library anymore, uh, older, I guess, yes. Oh, and, and at that time, of course, they were, uh, they were demanding um, library training from people, uh, you know, from librarians. And of course, she didn't have library training, uh, uh, college training. But um, she was an eccentric, uh, even when I knew her then, because one of the things that struck me as so funny, and, and I was always so amused about it, and I can see her still sitting at that desk, she always wore a big hat, sitting at the charge desk. And uh, you never saw her in the library without that hat on. And I always thought it was so amusing uh, but of course everybody, all the old timers knew Carrie and they, they knew that that was just the way she was. But as she grew older she became uh, a recluse and uh, she lived in her house there and was not well and um, her friends looked out for her, especially Jenny. Now she and Jenny were old schoolgirl chums. They'd always been very, very close friends and all through the years Jenny looked after Carrie. And uh, of course, Carrie was very independent. I mean, it, even at the last, she wouldn't do what people told her to do. She wasn't going to get out of that house when she was very, very ill. 
But um, <coughs> once you left the house, it was uh, it was the kind of a thing like you read about in the papers about the um, the recluse, the people who are recluses, you know, that you can't open the front door because of the newspapers stacked inside the door, and, and that's the way the house was, they said. And there were people that went in that house. The family, I guess they couldn't lock it or didn't lock it, her nieces and nephews, um, people went in and just took took whatever they wanted to. And I know a man in town that told me that, uh, that I've been trying to get it from him ever since he told me, that he has a copy of her uh, wedding certificate, her wedding license, that he found up in the attic in that yeah, house. Be interested. We could get a copy oh, of I know where it is. And I would, I'm still going to keep asking him for it. But people went in and just took, I'm sure there were, there was a mint of historical things that people took out of her home because she, of course, never threw anything away. And fortunately, we have all of the, the um, Oral Huff letters uh, in our file. That's another story. I could, take, I could take another hour to talk about the Huff letters. Uh, they were written by uh, Orlo uh, to his uh, fiancée in New York and her return letters. And uh, Sandy, Kimball, and I uh, took, the, um, uh, took the slides that are over at St. Mary's of all of these letters uh, over to the county library uh, three or four years ago and ran them off on the reader printer so that we have them in print, we have them on paper instead of being uh, on a slide which is much easier to read, yes. and we have them in our library, and they're absolutely fascinating reading about uh, Lafayette in 1860, uh, um, you know, uh, absolutely fascinating reading, and things about uh, Shreve, and, and things about the old timers that, some of them scandalous, and <laughs> very interesting reading. <laughs> well, so, uh, so that, uh, that is how I knew uh, Carrie Van Meter. She finally, of course, was taken to a rest home and died. I don't just remember the day, date of her death. But um, that was what I knew about Carrie Van Meter. Then Mrs. Rosenberg, who was Mrs. Dewing when I knew her, she, um, Jenny Bickerstaff, was, of course, the very beloved early school teacher in Lafayette and in the county. Uh, her father and mother, her mother's name was Delilah. I love that name. Her father's name was James. So James and Delilah came to Lafayette in um, 1879. Jenny, Jenny was born in 1872, and I can always remember it because that's the year my mother was born. They were the same age. And she and my mother had become very good friends uh, because they both were interested in the same things. They were both interested in libraries and civic betterment and things like that, and they were always working together on such things. And uh, I can remember my mother telling me, and I can remember seeing them go out, uh, a knocking on doors and ringing doorbells, uh, asking people for a dollar uh, to raise money to build that little um, white library, the little cottage library that was on the corner there of uh, Moraga Boulevard, Moraga Road. Moraga Road and Moraga and Boulevard. Boulevard. It was built on school property. And they, uh, they took it off, of course, because it was right there uh, in the, in the par practically in the parking lot of where the present library is. Well, at any rate, um, um, Jenny and my mother and, uh, and some other women who were dedicated to that, raised the money to build that building. And uh, she and my mother were charter members of the Library Association, the Organized Library Association. They were charter members of the Women's Forum, which is n has now been become the Women's Club. Women's, yes, yeah, the Women's, Lafayette, Lafayette Women's Club. Club. Yeah, it was a Lafayette Women's Forum then. And they both held offices, president and everything. Mother was historian for years at the very end. Uh, so I used to see her often, and then she was Mrs. Dewing, and she was a, just a charming woman. Uh, always had such a sweet smile on her face, and she had a kind of a round, uh, rosy pink face, and um, uh, very quiet, demure, 
uh, but she was one of these women like the hand in the, the iron hand in the velvet glove. <laughs> she seemed to be so <laughs> charming and so feminine, but she was one that could get things done, and she did. Um, <clears throat> then, um, as an as a as an only child of Delilah and James, she was seven years old when they came to Lafayette. She knew Elam Brown, and I can remember her telling, she told me a number of times, what a very fine old man he was, and that although he looked so stern and had these heavy lines in his face and frown lines, that she said he was just a darling, and everybody called him Grandpa Brown, and she said she used to, when she was a little girl, walk with him and hold his hand and walk from his house over to uh, the Pioneer store to get his mail. and. Uh, of course, one of the greatest regrets of my life, and always has been and always will be, that we didn't have this library association going when um, Jenny Bickerstaff was alive. Oh, the things she could have told us. She could have told us just exactly where Elam Brown's mill was and what it looked like. And m m dozens and dozens of other things she could have told us. But that's the way life goes. But you know, there's a story about her when she went away to normal that I'm not sure that many people will find this. It's in the files someplace in, uh, I don't know, it's a newspaper article or what it's in. When she finished grammar school, um, uh, she, uh, of course, she was going to go on and get her teaching credential. So she was going to San Jose to San Jose Normal, which was a two-year course. Well, her father and mother, I suppose, uh, would not uh, would not let trust uh, not I don't mean trust her but I mean to shelter her and take care of her they wouldn't they wouldn't have her go down there at San Jose I guess in board and room someplace so you know what they did they leased their little ranch they had a little ranch right there uh, that they had bought from Elam Brown and they leased their ranch and they went down there and lived for two years and this is the way they went. I read this description in something, I don't know whether it was a history book or it was an article that someone wrote. Um, they, uh, they had a wagon and a, and a team of horses, and they had a cow on this little ranch, and, um, and Jenny had her horse Topsy, whose picture we have seen so often in our picture file. They took the horse and wa they took the wagon and team and packed their things, they, attached, they tied the cow to the back of the wagon. And Jenny rode her a horse topsy, and they went to San Jose. And I think that is a priceless story <laughs> about, <laughs> about her, uh, her going to college. Then, of course, um, I can remember this so well because this came later. In 1942, when Jenny was 72 years old, she lived to be 93, when she was 72 years old, she married William Rosenberg. Well, Fern, may I interrupt? Would you tell us a little bit about Mr. Dewing? I wish I could. I have been trying to get uh, Mr. Dewing's granddaughter, who is Laurie Laird in Martinez, and she's a good friend of mine. Laurie Laird's grandfather was Mr. Dewing, and Laurie Laird has told me a number of times uh, about how fond she was of, of Mrs doing she knew her and of course she was her grandmother uh, uh, what do you call well, anyhow she married her Laurie, Laurie's grandfather and and uh, and of course although a um, uh, Jenny uh, doing uh, never had any children of her own because she was what we call in in those days an old maid when she married him um, he had several children his wife had died he had several children, and this is what I wanted to find out, something more definite. And, uh, and uh, Jenny raised those children. Yes, in addition to that, she was a, uh, a foster mother to the Boyer boys, who owned a ranch right next to theirs on Mount Diablo Boulevard there. And later on, Rex Boyer became a very fine attorney in, uh, in uh, Martinez. He was an attorney there for years. And his brother um, became a judge and lived in Antioch and just died not long ago. And it was this relative of this Judge Boyer that gave us Jenny's portrait, the big frame portrait. Well, that, that's all in the story. I tried to get a hold of Lori Laird. I wanted to ask Lori 
about her grandfather, so, you know, just something about him, what he was like and how old he was when they were married and, and uh, if his wife, you know, had died and uh, wh where he lived and what property he owned. And I under had st understood from my mother that he, he was a rancher, that he owned ranch. But you know, uh, he's, he, uh, there's a street name for him over here, not far, um, not far from Olympic. And there's a park named for him, the Dewey Park. So he um, he was a rancher. That's what he was. And I wish uh, I don't even know his first name. And I tried to get Lori. I tried to get Lori for three weeks before we were going to do this this interview. And she must be uh, she must be on a trip. I couldn't get her. Because I did want to say something about Mr. Doing. <laughs> well, at any rate, she'd been a widow for years. She was a widow all through the 30s and the, and the 40s. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know when she became a widow from Mr. Dewing. I don't know when he died. At any rate, she went down to Santa Cruz to, uh, to school, to a summer school. She was always going to school, even when she was old. She just loved it. And she had become so interested in the harmonica, of all things, and was learning to play the harmonica. And she went down there to summer school to take some harmonica lessons at Santa Cruz, and she met William Rosenberg. William Rosenberg was a charming gentleman of the old school. He was born in Austria or Bavaria or someplace and was a very fine antique uh, furniture restorer. You know what I mean? He worked with antique furniture, uh, making it and um, repairing it and such things. Well, Mr. Dewing, of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Rosenberg, of course, is still alive. He'll be, eight, he's 89 this month, living in a rest home in Oakland. And I talk to him occasionally, and he told me, he's told me many things about, uh, we're, oh, that's one thing, we're definitely going to get an interview with, with Mr. Rosenberg. That, he's one of the first ones on our list. Well, he can, can tell us with that many time. things about Jenny. He never called her Jenny. He said that she did not like the name of Jenny, and as a little girl she was always called Jenny, but as she grew older and became a teacher, and all the rest of her life she was called Margaret. And it, to me it's rather, well, it's interesting to think that we have gone back to calling her Jenny in our historic and all of our records and all of our pictures and everything she's called Jenny, but he said that she did not care for that name. At any rate, my mother, I can remember my mother and all of her friends and all of the, all of the um, uh, club women, well, everybody in the country was just absolutely horrified. He told me that he courted her for 10 years. She met him in, at, at Santa Cruz in the harmonica class. Uh, she was very musical, by the way, and oh, she had the most beautiful rosewood spinet piano oh he has it now up in in the where he's living just a beautiful thing and um so he fell in love with her of course and she he said he courted her for almost 10 years before he could talk her in she said that she she would have married him but i think she had a feeling it was how it would look for oh in addition to that he was much much younger than she uh, but of course she she looked young and acted young and she was so keen <laughs> she was 72. at any rate they got married and it created a regular for her. everybody was horrified they said oh he's just married her for her money well i don't know how much money mrs <laughs> doing had um at any rate everybody lived to eat those words because he proved to be the most marvelous husband for her. He was so lovely to her and he was perfectly charming. He took her every place. He just waited on her hand and foot right up till the very last. His every thought was for her. So it, the story turned out very, very well. well that's good. Yes. <laughs> and then I want to say uh, maybe uh, at the last, I think that's all that I, I can say about um, Mrs. Uh, Doing, Mrs. Rosenberg. Um, I went to her funeral. 
her funeral, she died at, at age 93. Her funeral was 60. Well, I haven't got the date on that funeral. At any rate, to me, her funeral was very meaningful. And you know, it was the kind of a thing that a woman had lived such a full life that it it wasn't too sad. It, it was uh, it was kind of, uh, well, you couldn't say it, happy, not really happy, but it was nice. She was, she had the, they had the funeral services in the Methodist church. And right next door, just right through the doorway, was the school room in which she had taught for a number of years. And of course she had been, she was a very, very religious woman. And she had been an ardent church worker there all those 80 years or more. One of the uh, stand buys in the church. Um, so um, having her, in fact, it was mentioned uh, during the service that uh, she, it was such a happy uh, feeling that everyone had that here she was here, uh, right where she had began, been when she began uh, in her teaching in, uh, in 1900. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and then of course she was buried in the Lafayette Cemetery in, in the family plot where Delilah and James are there. And um, so Jenny doing, Jenny Bickerstaff doing Rosenberg is a, well, just a very special kind of a pioneer. I mean, she's just something that, I don't know just exactly how you could say very it, but she's just, person. She's just part of uh, of Lafayette from the very beginning. <laughs> and I always felt so fortunate that I lived long enough to know her and um, enjoyed her so much. Now do we need to count 10 again? Before we close, Fern, won't you tell us a little bit about your association with the organizations uh, in Lafayette and in the county? Well, I guess this had, might have something to do with Lafayette history. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I have been active in the county, uh, starting from my uh, early days in Martinez. Um, when I went in there to teach English in the high school, of course, they gave me a few books they had. Uh, I was uh, given charge of the books, and uh, 11 years later I had a library of 6,000 books, and, and I'd become a librarian and had, uh, had uh, gotten my library credential. So then I was started on being a school librarian. Then I worked for um, the county superintendent of schools, B.O. Wilson, and um, a number of uh, the officials in his, his department uh, in a study of all the school libraries in the county. And I was on that committee, it was a large committee, uh, from draw, drawn from people all over the county, uh, educators. I was on that committee for three years. And we made studies and we made recommendations and by that time, of course, I was a professional librarian. And in the county, uh, th- at that time, I think there were about six, in all the schools in the county, there were only about six professional librarians. Uh, so that was what we wanted to stress. We wanted to get professional librarians into the schools, which we did. So I worked on that committee. I became very active in it and wrote some wrote some some pamphlets that are in the county department on that. And I wrote some manuals which were used by other school libraries throughout throughout the state. And some went farther than that, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and it was through that uh, work that I got my fine position, my final position, rather, that I loved so much that I had the last 11 years as a supervisor of school libraries in Pittsburgh. And there I had 13 libraries with professional librarians in each building, and it was a, it was simply a marvelous way to end one's career. So, so much for my uh, work with the county and um, and with helping to uh, advance the uh, school library program in the county. 
Then, of course, I was a Mills uh, graduate, and I became interested in uh, in the Mount Diablo Mills Club. And um, after I retired, then I had time to work in that, and I was president of the Mount Diablo Mills Club for a couple of years. And then I was pre I was on the uh, Mills Alumni Board, uh, the National Mills Alumni Board, for three years in the uh, late 60s. Um, so much for Mills. Oh, so in Lafayette, as soon as I retired, somebody asked me to be president of the Lafayette Library Association. So I took that job on. I was president of that for a couple of years, and then I was on the library board in Lafayette for, oh, five or six years, I guess. Uh, so while I was on the um, Library Association board, circumstances came up about some historical materials in town, whereby it seemed necessary for us to organize a committee. So I organized uh, on the board a called a historical committee, which has now become, since 1967, the Lafayette Historical Society. Thank you, Fern, for talking with us this afternoon. You've given us some interesting highlights of Lafayette, especially of the 30s and 40s. Thank you again.